South Brook. This is my guy. This is it's all for Leah. Well done. Give it up for her. Dude, I love it. I love my church. I love 930. What a what a great time to be with you. Happy Father's Day, everyone. Um, hey, I just my yesterday we do this thing. My sister, obviously my family's in Louisville. My sister always loves to let me know how she gets ahead of the game before me. Right? So like yesterday, she's like, oh, I'm out, we're out to dinner with dad. I'm like, shut up. Like, I get it, man. Like, cool, you're first, right? Like, we just have a good time. And my dad is funny. He's watching. Hey, Wade. I always call him Wade when he's acting crazy. So yesterday, he called me and he goes, hey, happy early Father's Day. Um, I think I deserve a shout out on stage. Um, I said, are you serious right now? And that's what I called him, Wade. Come on, Wade, get it together. But no, seriously, I want to, all the father, father figures, because we also know that, man, not everyone had a father in their life. Uh, we know that there are many single moms that play both roles, and we say, hey, happy Father's Day to you as well. We know there's coaches and teachers out there who have fathers, figures for many. And so we just want to say, hey, fathers, father figures, we see you. My gosh, we appreciate you. My dad, here you are, right there in the living room watching. Hey, love you, brother. Thank you so much for your leadership. Hey, right? Remember that? Next time I need uh, a nice little check sent my way. <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah. See, they love it. They fully agree. Fully agree. But no, seriously, we are so glad you're here this morning. Uh, we are starting a new series. And so today I want to do something maybe a little different. I got like two parts to this today. All right. You may be thinking, oh, it's going to be a long one. I promise it's not. Father's Day gift will be, we'll get out of here early and we'll go grill and hit the golf course, okay? But here's what we're going to do. I want to give a little background because we're talking about this series and it's called New Covenant. What does that mean if you're not a churchgoer? What does covenant mean? What is that, what is that all about? So I want to do a little background on what that terminology is, why we're talking about it. And then the second part is I'm going to go into what, what my message is specific today, okay? Can we do that? We got this? We're going to do this? And so we're going to do a little, hey, history lesson I think it's good. It might be a little bit uh, like we're going to Bible college for a moment here today. Um, but I think as you journey with us, with me, you'll see, man, how this just jumps off the page about how on a Father's Day we talk about our Heavenly Father that many of us in this room might not have had a present father. But in the faith, we are reminded that we constantly have this Heavenly Father who is there for us at all times who loves us more than anyone could ever love us, who has imputed us with value and purpose and mission. And today you'll see another reminder of how much love the Father bestows on us this morning. So if we can, let's jump into it. We're talking about the New Covenant series. You'll hear this terminology a lot from Paul. Um, he talks a lot about New Covenant. You'll see it here in 2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6. In fact, this series is all rooted in 2 Corinthians Okay, so you're going to hear from me this week. You're going to hear from my buddy Levi next week. Um, I'm back up the week after, and then we got a cool we got a cool thing we're doing uh, a week after that with Miss Claire Brown. I'm excited to have her here with us, and so we got a really exciting series we're going to be in. But this ter this term of new covenant, Paul talks a lot about this, and so this is why it's important for us to give a background to this. What does this mean when we say covenant, and why is the new covenant so important for us to understand? And so he talks in 2 Corinthians 3, he says this, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. He uses this term uh, consistently throughout the New Testament in his various letters, this new covenant. And so today, when we talk about covenant, we must understand what is this, what is this term? What is this word? And a covenant is, it's not simply, but a kind of a definition here is like it's a bond, it's an agreement, it's a partnership. Listen to this. It is a relationship between two parties who make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. They're often accompanied by oaths and signs and ceremonies. In fact, many of them are accompanied with sacrifices to seal the deal. Covenants define obligations and commitments, but they are different from a contract because they are relational and personal. In fact, you might have heard it many times, think of it like a marriage, a marriage covenant. A husband and a wife choose to enter into a formal relationship, binding themselves to one another in lifelong faithfulness and devotion. I love this definition uh, of the late, great Tim Keller. He said it like this, a covenant is a solemn, permanent, whole self-giving of two parties to each other. It is more intimate and loving than simply a mere contract, but more binding and accountable than a mere relationship. 
And so we've kind of set the stage on what is a covenant. They're found out throughout all of the Bible. The Old Testament is riddled with covenants between God and his people. There are personal covenants between two individuals. David and Jonathan, good friends, made a covenant together in 1 Samuel. Political covenants between two kings of a nation, Solomon and King Hiram in 1 Kings. Over and over, you see these agreements throughout the Old Testament. And I want us to see today and understand why it's a big deal. Because God understood the background that humanity knew of covenants and agreements, and he operated within this system with the people of old and of the people of today as you and I sit here. We we are walking in a new covenant, but we got to talk about this a little bit, okay? And so, hey, throughout the Old Testament, you're going to see a variety of covenants that stand out. And maybe some of you, 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 you understand this and you've seen this, or it's a reminder. In fact, these are the five most prevalent covenants that took place in Scripture, and there's others throughout, but these are the ones that kind of, that are the, the ones that are just stand out the most. In fact, I don't have it on here, but there was an agreement that started in the Garden of Eden. If you remember, right, God had an agreement with his creation. His creation could walk among him, that he dwelled with his people. They walked together, but there was a pact that was made, right? You remember, don't eat of what? That tree. They broke the covenant, the deal that was made. It was conditional, and because of that, humanity could no longer walk in the presence of God. They were removed from his presence, the very real presence, the garden. They were, they were removed from him. And so there was that separation that now entered in because of sin and because of their choice. And so now we know this to be real, that God and us, are on, we're not on the same level. He is holy. He is righteous. We are not. Sin is broken in. So there's now this separation. But in the Old Testament, God tries to make a way with his people. The first one we talk about here is the Noahic covenant. This was an unconditional deal. There was nothing you could do. This was God doing all the work. This was fresh after the flood. That God enters a formal relationship with Noah and all living creatures, promising that despite humanity's corruption, he would what? Never flood what? The earth again. That was the deal. That was a covenantal agreement God made. I will keep my promise, and he is faithful to to do that. In Genesis 8, you can read about that. The next one is the Abrahamic covenant, the deal he made with Abraham. You can read this as well. Throughout Genesis 9 through 11, it traces the downward spiral of the evil that is running rampant in the world. Um, We're left to wonder kind of during this time, how will God restore his good work? God's rescue plan continues, and he calls Abraham into a covenantal relationship. He promises Abraham a huge family that will inherit a piece of land in Canaan and bring about universal blessing to all humanity. Okay? Similar to the Noah covenant, this covenant came with a sign. If you remember, the Noah covenant was, hey, God makes a deal. Here is my sign to prove it to you, a rainbow in the sky. The Abrahamic covenant had a sign as well, not nearly as fun as the rainbow. And some of you laugh because you know that the sign was circumcision. Um, That was the deal. Hey, guys, sorry. Some of you might be older, but this is going down, right? This This is the sign of my deal. It means our people are set apart. That it was a symbol that sets Abraham and his family apart and shows that their fertility and future lay in God's hand. This covenant was both conditional and unconditional. God and Abraham each had a part to play, but ultimately, God will keep his promise to give Abraham a family who will inherit the land and bless the world. So we've done Noah, we've done Abraham, and then comes Moses. Constantly, you see this, that the the depravity, the downfall of humanity throughout the Old Testament. This is why I love the Old Testament so much. Man, my thing is I love... Obviously, I love the New Testament because that is the crux of our faith in Jesus. But what I love about the Old Testament is this. It's a book. It's books of their history. But what it is, it paints the, the best picture, I think, of what humanity is. It is me, to be real with you. The Old Testament is the history of God's people. That This constant cycle is what it's called. That, hey, God is great. God is wonderful. God provides. God heals. God redeems. He's, he brings salvation. But I get bored with him. And they slowly turn their back on him. And they turn themselves over to foreign gods and foreign cultures. And they lose sight of God. And God essentially gives them over to, the, to their wandering. 
and they are separated from God. They get thrown into exile. They get mistreated and all this, and all of a sudden they, they remember God. And they say, God, save us. Can you help us? Will you, will you redeem us? Will you deliver us? And God is faithful. And then you see this cycle. It happens once again and again and again. And I think why I love the Old Testament, it paints the picture so well that nothing much has changed from then to now. That for many of us, me included, hey, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm better. What I'm saying is I, I can empathize. What I'm saying is as we get going through our life and the comf, comfy coziness of it, it's easy to lose sight of God. And there's times that, man, God, please, man, I'm sorry I lost sight of this. I'm sorry I doubted you. I'm sorry I tried to choose my own way in the midst of this. Can you please forgive me and restore me? And he is faithful. And that's why I love when we talk about the Old Testament because it's so much of what humanity is even today. And so let's jump back in the Mosaic Covenant. After fresh off a harrowing escape from Egypt, the people reach the foot of Mount Sinai. You remember where God shows up to revisit the promises he made to Abraham. Okay? Acting as a representative for Israel, Moses ascends the mountain to hear the terms of God's new covenant deal with his people. He promises to make Israel into this holy kingdom, into a royal priesthood as a term it says. God instructed Israel to obey all the laws given at Mount Sinai, promising to bring blessing if they followed his commands, and here it is, and curses if they ignored them. Israel's allegiance to God will be outwardly reflected in the way they choose to live keeping the commands, and most notably observing the weekly Sabbath. So here is where the law, and again, this is where when, when, when Paul talks about new covenant, he is contrasting it with the old covenant, the old, the law of which was passed down here. You see, the law, the Ten Commandments were given to Moses on the mountaintop, and these would be kind of the regulating laws that his people are to follow, and they blow it. Because here's the thing, when the law was given, when God passed this down, there was no way none of us could follow this perfectly. See, the law was to reveal that you're in need of a Savior. The law was to reveal that you can't level up to God. And we'll talk about how that leveling up happens, right? But the Mosaic law was a new covenant that was made between God and his people. It was fully conditional. That his people were in a, in a time of blessing when they were doing well and honoring God, and they were struggling when they weren't. It was conditional. And then we have the Davidic covenant. David becomes a successful leader. He's overcoming Israel's enemies, restoring order. He wants to build a temple for God to, so he can dwell physically among his people again. God responds to this desire by making a deal with David, promising to make his name great, to raise up a descendant from David's line whose throne and kingdom would last forever. David and his descendants must remain faithful to God Following these new laws, however, despite David and his son's failure, once again, God keeps his promise to provide a faithful descendant of David to reign. And so through the Old Testament, you see these new deals being made, these updated deals being made until we get to the New Testament. Because here's the thing, as you will see, the old way of things, the old covenants were about you constantly doing and trying and striving. And we'll talk more about what the daily routine would look like. But you were to co constantly strive and do and do to make yourself better in sight of God. But there is nothing we can truly do to make that perfect. And that's why when the New Testament comes, there is a new way to live. There is a new covenant, and that is called the Messianic Covenant. This new covenant for generations, Israel ignored the terms of covenants with God, breaking commands, living by their own definitions of good and evil amidst rebellion and exile. The Hebrew prophets spoke of a new day to come. A new covenant was coming, saying that God would one day fulfill all his promises, repairing his relationships with his people and blessing all nations through them. This new covenant is to be everlasting. God will write his law on the hearts of his people, bring complete forgiveness of sin, raise up a faithful king from the line of David who will restore all the brokenness in the world. And I love this. One of my favorite, uh, man, modern day theologians, maybe many of you, you have probably have heard him speak, whether you realize it or not. How many of you are familiar with the Bible Project? Some of you, right? It's, it's the animate. It is an, a wealth of knowledge. If you are saying, Eric, where do I get started? How do I learn more? Go to the Bible Project. It is so comprehensive of these videos. So it's these two guys. Tim Mackey is the theologian behind it, who's the one that speaks, who takes Scripture and, and takes uh, the, the books of the Bible, who takes 
figures in scripture and they animate. He's got an artist friend who's unbelievable. So it's, it's animated, but it is painting the picture of things, hey, we want to learn about. And he talks about covenants, and he does this. He is a, a professor. He speaks at the Western Seminary. He is just really good at what he does, and I, I love his work. And he said this, and I love this. Do you notice how the covenants progressively build upon one another, forming a complete redemptive story? Listen to this. First, God preserved the world through Noah. He initiated redemption through Abraham. He established the nation of Israel through Moses. He promised an eternal shepherd king through David and then fulfilled all of his covenants through the person of Jesus. With each covenant, God's promises and plans to save the world become clearer and clearer until we finally see that redemption can only come through King Jesus. Jesus, is my, in my term, is the covenantal climax. He is the peak of all deals. He is the peak of all promises. This is what it means to live in the new covenant. The new covenant is simply this. God makes a deal with you and I. There's no way we can level up. There's no way Eric can do anything to make himself right before God. So Jesus, being the perfect sacrifice, makes us right before God by what he chose to do. That anyone who chooses to follow him and says, hey, you are the Lord of my life. I want to live, live my life to follow your way. I want to be covered and, and just, just, just who you are. I have now been promised forgiveness of sins and eternity with God. It is both conditional because you have to accept this gift, right? This isn't like, hey, God does it and we're all good. No, no, it's a gift he, he extends to you in the person of Jesus. Here's where it's conditional. I say this about, about the message of Jesus. It is both inclusive and exclusive. It's inclusive because anyone has access to it. It is for all people. He hands this gift to you and says, will you take this? It's exclusive because you have to take it. And I wholeheartedly believe this. Jesus said the way of the Father is through the what? The son. So it is. It is a gift that he gives you, an unbelievable gift that he extends to you, but you have to say, I need this. I want this. And so Paul talks about the new covenant. See, the new covenant is much better than anything of the old. And so today, before we get going in today's specific focus, we, I, I had to give a background to this. What is a covenant? What is this agreement? And so as we start off in this series, we're going to talk about this new covenant and the benefits of the new covenant. And specifically today, we're going to talk about that in this new covenant, uh, there's a new pleasing aroma of the new covenant. And so, hey, how many of you today, family are gathered, we're doing this as well, that a large part of the family gathering, Father's Day or whatever, you're going to be, man, we're, we're grilling out some delicious meats today. Anybody? We grilling out today? We getting together? Like five of you? No, most of you not at all. We don't want to be together at all. Like, yeah, yeah. We were just, funny you say, we were just laughing about this today, Mother's Day and Father's Day. That Mother's Day, my mom, I remember my mom would say, wait, hey, we're all going to church. We're going to church. Father's Day is like, hey, let's go golf. Let's go away. Let's go grill. <laughs> like, let's get the grill started early. Like, let's do this thing, right? It's so funny. Um, but I was thinking about this today, that our focus today is this, is this scripture right here. I'm going to focus down here in the middle, but I'll read all of it in context. Paul is writing again to his church in Corinth, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Christ everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death, to the other, an aroma that brings life. So Paul's talking about the new covenant, the context of the new covenant, that in the new covenant, there is this new pleasing aroma. It's aroma that smells of Christ and what he did for us. That's what he is talking about here. And so we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit. So I was thinking about this, uh, this aroma, right? That, that science tells us that the sense of smell is almost instinctively linked the most to memory. Your thought about this. Maybe you have... You, uh, and I was sharing this week with, with my group, we were talking about this, was, he was like, because <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird thing to talk about smells. I mean, right? Like, it's not a conversation starter, right? I remember I popped in, he's where I said, hey, what smells come to mind? Do you, do you have certain smells that bring back memories? He's like, what, what are you saying? And he, he's like, you have an angle here. What are the smells that bring back memories for you? I'm like, oh, I'm glad you asked, right? But it is true. I, if I walk in to a home, not a lot of people do this anymore, really, but if I smell mothballs, 
launches me into grandma's home. Every, boy, I'm there. If I smell mothballs, that was the entire basement. The laundry was down in the basement. It was like it took it jettisoned me back to little Eric running around the basement, getting in trouble for, for literally everything. Uh, because that's what I was, I was a troublemaker. Um, and it was just that. It took me there every time. Or if I walk into a gym, this is what I love. If I walk into a basketball gym, it, it takes me back to Eric in high school in Louisville, Kentucky. How many smells? Fresh cut lawn. Maybe you can think of. Maybe for some of you, it was walking with the lawnmower. I remember when my son was young. That's what he would do. He had the middle bar, and he would walk with me. It takes you back there. Scents are a big thing. We don't really talk about it. It, it, was, a, it was a big thing in the early church, uh, in the early movements. The Roman Greco world was, was surrounded in, in essence of scents, uh, of um, you know, sacrifices were made within the church throughout the Old Testament to the New, the, the scent of a sacrifice on the altar that would rise up. And you see in Scripture this painted constantly where it says, again, I told you earlier that we, uh, we are not on the same, right, not on the same level playing field as God. And so this thing happened in the Old Testament where God's people said, we, we kind of want a place, a building for God. And before we have a physical building, we want a mobile one. Because God's people were constantly moving. They haven't settled in the land that was promised. So they wanted to have a physical place for God to reside and to dwell in. And so the first kind of church they made was what was called the tabernacle. It was a mobile church. They built this thing so it would kind of have God's physical presence there. And so they did this thing, but something happened that I don't think they were ready for. They built it, and it gives this image of this cloud above it where God's presence dwelled amongst it, inside of it. And Moses went to go enter, but something happened. He couldn't enter. They go, so I think it would have been like the biggest backfire. Oh, wait, I can't go in with you? No, dude, you're not on my, on my level playing field. See, God's righteous, God's holy. Moses wasn't. He couldn't enter in. God's people couldn't enter in. And so they made, a, again, essentially a deal, a pact, a covenant, if you will, that you have to be made right before you can enter into his presence. And so this will take us into what I mean about this pleasing aroma to God, that the first thing they started to do to make themselves right was they had to sacrifice animals. And it happened long before the tabernacle was built. It happened when I talked to you earlier about Noah. If you remember, fresh off Noah's at the, the boat hitting land, Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Here it is. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again. Here's that Noah covenant. Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I've done. So it's this, this, this image that Noah is sacrificing to make things right, and it says this aroma reached heaven, this pleasing aroma to God. In Exodus 29, it talks about instructions again. Then burn the entire ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. And here it is. A pleasing aroma, a food offering presented to the Lord. God is pleased by it. It is making things right. And then in Leviticus 1, an exciting book if you want to jump into. <laughs> if you love rules and regulations, many of you might. This might be your book, right? But in Leviticus 1 is where they put regulations around sacrifices. And this one is specific to, man, this, this was a daily thing. This was right after the tabernacle, tabernacle was constructed. Here's what you're to do. Because God is here, you are here. We got to, to, for me to dwell with God, I got to make myself right before God. And so you had to offer a burnt offering. And here's the instructions. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are offered to offer a male without defect. There's a big reason why it says this, right? Because see, here's the thing. What you possessed, your animals were your way of life. And here's this proclivity for humans. Whew, I'm going to say I've been guilty of this, that maybe I'll, maybe I'll just give the, the one cow that isn't healthy, God. You hear this? Or maybe I'll just give half of something. Maybe not fully trusting in you. And that's why he says, a male without defect. This is a sacrifice you're making to say, you trust me. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting, what's another term for tabernacle, so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to, here it is, you're going to hear this, you are to lay your hand on the head of that offering, and it will be set, accepted on your behalf. It will make atonement for you. 
It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma, once again, pleasing to the Lord. And so this was a bull for people that were doing well financially. In fact, if you read Leviticus, it gives the whole breakdown. If you're middle class, hey, goat, sheep. If you're poor, you can do, a, it's a bird. It's literally what it's, he's saying that the point is you are sacrificing something because you're saying, Lord, I trust you with all my provisions. And at the same time, I place my hand upon this sacrifice to say, I am not right before you. I need to place my sin on something innocent and clean. And it takes, it atones for my sin and brokenness. You see, the purpose of these sacrifices was to facilitate communion with God, seek forgiveness of sins, express gratitude, and maintain the covenant relationship between God and his people, the Israelites. And so, when we flip to the New Testament, we see things have changed mightily. See, Christ hits the stage as I reminded you earlier, Christ is a covenantal climax. He is the covenant that ends all covenants. Because his life, he comes along. And see, the covenants of the Old Testament were to show us humans that we can't, we can't level up to this. We can't live up to the demands of these. Only one person could. The perfect son of God came and held and kept all the demands of the laws, all the demands of the covenants. He lived them perfectly, and then he went to the cross for you and me, like the bulls, the goats, and the birds of the Old Testament, and said, I am going to be sacrificed on an altar for you to atone for your sins so you can be made right forever before God. And so no longer were covenants needed anymore, because Jesus is the end-all, be-all. No longer do you and I have to come before the church on a daily basis and sacrifice something on an altar because Jesus was sacrificed on an altar to end all sacrifices. And so when God says this pleasing aroma drifted up to God and he was pleased, Paul uses that reference again. Paul is very much a student of the Old Testament. He is utilizing the images of the Old Testament, for we are to God now the pleasing aroma of who? Eric? No, 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 of Christ. What he's saying is, because we have now taken that gift that is freely offered, I have accepted and chosen to follow Christ, to make him a Lord and Savior. Paul is saying, because of this new covenant, because we have given our life to Christ, we are now a pleasing aroma to God on behalf of Christ. What this means, think about this. I like to think about these things, that one day, oh Lord, I pray that this is true. I feel like it is, but hopefully it is, that one day I will walk to the gates of heaven and I will stand before God and God will do this thing. And I, and I use this image like, like my son, my six-year-old. The dude plays hard. He gets dirty. He gets nasty. He smells awful at times. And I'm like, Carter, get into the bathtub. I can't smell you. It's gross. He gets clean. He gets soaked up. And he comes down, jumps in my lap. And I smell him. And I'm like, <sighs> you walk to the gate of heaven. I walk to the gates of heaven. God grabs you. He hugs you. He smells you. And for those who claim Christ and Christ has covered you with his sacrifice, he smells that aroma of Christ. And it is pleasing. And you are loved and you are known and you are valued and you are welcomed because of Christ. And so the New Testament shows this all over. If it's a reminder, Ephesians 5 says this, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a what? Fragrant offering. That means a pleasing aroma to God and sacrifice to God. The new is much better than the old. That Christ went to the cross to say, I will be the end-all, be-all for all of those who want to accept this gift freely given. And so the timeline is Old Testament, we are sacrificing, literally, the, the tradition was twice a day. Every day, 
you are sacrificing to make yourself right before God. You are doing, you are doing, you are doing. It's still not enough. It's still not enough. It's still not enough until we get to the New Testament and it is done because Jesus did it. And so we accept this gift, but see, here's the thing. While we don't sacrifice daily, there is a daily sacrifice. Because if you remember the words of Jesus, what do you say? Following him is like, what? take up your what and follow me. There's, there's a dying to self. There's a sacrificing to self. He says, to live is to what? To die. You must die. There's a daily sacrifice. Romans 12 paints this picture. Paul paints this picture. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to now what? Offer your what? Bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper form of worship. It now goes from this sense of, I'm not going out and sacrificing things, but every day I am called to sacrifice my wants, my desires, and what I, my cravings. So each and every day, we have this opportunity that plays out when we wake up and our feet hit the floor. Will I choose to sacrifice my selfish ambition and what Eric wants in all things, or I choose to say, no, I place my hand upon Jesus and say, hey, his way is way better than mine. It's hard. I walk into Kroger. It's an opportunity for me to sacrifice what I want when I'm angry, but I blow it. Someone cuts you off in traffic. Lord, I can sacrifice what I want. I really want to say it or show it. This person wronged me, and gosh, I just want to get back at them. My daughter, my son won't talk to me right now. I'm so angry. I just want to give him a piece of my mind, but God, I pray, and I pray, and that's all I can do. Sacrifice. This is sacrifice, and we don't like this in the Western world, 2023. The world we live in says, live your truth, live your truth, live your truth. No, I don't want to live my truth because I know where that will get me. I want to live his truth. I want to sacrifice my way for him because when I do, it is a pleasing aroma to God. Absolutely. Amen. And so as we wrap up, I just want to remind us of some things that we start off in this new series. This is a simple truth right here. We all need a substitute. See, the Old Testament was a substitute. You put the animal on the altar, that was a substitute. Because I placed my hand upon the head of that animal, it was a substitute for me, for my wrong. It was a toning for me. It is making up for me. It is a substitute for me. And here's what it is now. Christ is the substitute. If you're sitting there and you're saying, man, but hey, my past is checkered, man. It is rough. It is dicey. Just last night, it was dicey. Last week was awful. Christ says, I died. Place your hand upon me. It doesn't matter. I am here for you. I, I atone for you. I am the pleasing aroma of a life that might not have been that great. And I am a testament to that, church. Believe me. We all need a new aroma. That our ways, if we, if we press the flesh and we chase our own agenda, it is a stench-filled aroma before God. But if you chase and pursue the things of Christ, absolutely it is a pleasing aroma. Christ is the new aroma. So Paul makes implicitly clear. We are people of the new covenant. And when we are covered in the sacrifice of Christ and what he did for us, we are now a pleasing aroma before God because of that sacrifice. This is a big one because we do. We want to try to improve the way we smell. We think there's some sort of fragrance, some spirituality I can spray on myself. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's done. All you need to do is accept Christ. That's it. It's done. You see, this way of life is the old covenant. I must do. I must strive. I must do more. I must do more. No, 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 no. It's been done. It's done. It's done. It's done. Now I just need to leave faithfully and walk in this new narrative that is Christ-filled and smells of Christ. So my question to you is when you leave this place and you walk into your family room, you walk into your boardrooms, you walk into your cubicle, your office, you walk and you lead your team of players and athletes, you teach your classrooms with students, does it smell of a new aroma? And I'm not saying this is you preaching from a corner. I'm just saying with your life, is your life a living sacrifice that smells of Christ? It's hard. My gosh, I can't tell you. 
it's hard. You know that I use the imagery constantly, like the faith, the journey of faith is like shoots and ladders. It's hard. There's a day you're doing so good. You're three to four levels up. You've even hit the big ladder and you're like on the, you feel like you're on the final row. You're on that, you're almost getting home. Dag off, you don't hit that slide. It takes you back to the first level, right? But man, what this new aroma is, what Christ says is that that's a reality. Romans says all fall short. But he picks you up, he dusts you off. Let's go. Just like your kid, you're getting that kid to learn how to ride the bike. They're going to fall, they're going to fall, they're going to fall. You're going to be there for them. You're going to bandage their womb. You're going to kiss their head. You're going to put them on that bike and say, let's go. That's what it is. And as we wrap up, it's simply this. The new is better than the old. We are now walking in this new reality. This is the focus as we start off in this new series. But here's the thing. As you leave here and know that it, those who claim Christ and that walk in this reality, you are this amazing, pleasing aroma before God. Not because of anything I've done, but because of everything he has done. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this church. I love it. I love, not because I love being on stage, my gosh, this, this thing I could do without, but I love these people. I love the spirit that comes in here. And it's all sorts of different spirits coming in. Absolutely, there's spirits that are coming in that are just simply broken. Lord, I need some hope. And the hope is Christ. There's some that just need some edification and encouragement. And the encouragement is Christ. It's all you. But it's this, this is why the church, the corporate gathering is so important because we come together from various branches of life and we all cling to this one branch of Christ. And that we are here and we're saying, hey, it is a struggle. It is hard to walk as humans in Christ in a fallen, broken world, but I'm going to try every day to sacrifice and die to self to live in your reality. And as we go from here into all our different avenues of life, that as we walk in Christ, there is an aroma that drifts up, not only to God, but to those around us. And Lord, we thank you for the one ultimate sacrifice that covered all sacrifices. And that was your willingness to die. While we will, were still sinners, you chose to die. Your love for us, and we thank you for that. We thank you that you're the one true heavenly father that shows us how all fatherhood should go. We thank you for your love, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you all.